Good morning. We rolling? We're good? Okay, sorry. I don't do this enough to know how this all works. I just hit the button, turn it on, and we're rolling. So um, it's good to see everybody this morning. I am obviously not Pastor Scott, um, nor Pastor Jeff. <laughs> um, they are at the uh, Minister and Mates Retreat. I believe it's a Stonewall Jackson. Is that right? Does that sound right? Um, and God bless them. I hope God is blessing the time that they're there. Um, they're human beings like us and carry weights just like us. And, um, you know, he doesn't get too many Sundays where he gets to sit in the crowd. You know, he doesn't get too many Sundays where he gets to receive the message. He's giving the message. So I, I hope that he finds this time with the other pastors and their wives um, around the district uh, as a time of renewal, of a time of revival for himself, that he can, um, uh, you know, refocus and, and, and seek God through uh, the messages that they're hearing and, and the messages that are being given to them. And the same for Pastor Jeff. Um, Pastor Jeff is such a blessing. Um, I know Pastor Scott's a lot of times up here doing the message and he's with us praying, but, but Pastor Jeff, I, I got a text from him last night and he said, brother, I'm praying for you. God's going to use you. And I was like, man, thank you. <laughs> you know, I was like, that's such a, you know, uh, by the way, it's nerve wracking if you're up here, if you're ever up here, you know. Um, so to get that message is kind of like, thank you, Lord. Um, but uh, uh, so I, I value our, our pastors that we have. Jeff Conway for um, providing a prayer this morning, and, and I thank you for that. Um, so anyways, I, I am by no means a pastor, <laughs> um, but I, I do feel like God um, provided a message for me. He, he always does. Um, when I've been asked to speak, it's pretty amazing. Usually... The last time was this time last year, actually, and, and Pastor said, hey, do you want to cover for me? And I was like, yeah, I, I can try that. That's new. Um, and the Lord had a message on my heart within minutes then. Um, literally, Pastor asked me this time, and, and again, by the time I'm texting him back, God says, hey, uh, I want you to look at Joel. And I'm going, what? <laughs> Joel, what are you talking about? We don't preach out of Joel. We preach out of Romans and out of Ephesians, and we preach out of Matthew and Mark. What are you, Joel? Um, you know, so <laughs> when I look at that, I, I, I had to laugh, and I kind of said, well, Lord, if that's the message you've given to me, then that's the message I'll work with. And so, you know, give me, give me the scripture. And I was like, uh, you know, and, and God says, well, all of it. I was like, what? <laughs> okay, this is great. <laughs> So the book of Joel I've never read before, and we're going to do all of it. This is fantastic. Um, but it's, God then starts moving, and he then starts bringing things together. He then starts pulling pieces together, and he starts opening your mind and your heart to, to what he wants you to say. And uh, in that there is faith, in that there is peace, and in that is why, yeah, it's sometimes nerve-wracking, but I can look out and see everybody and know that God has provided this message, and I, I am thankful for that. That being said, a um, little question and answer. The past two weeks, pastors given messages. Anybody remember last week's? Anybody? Wow! And we talked about the armor, the shield, but last week was, was power over the little things, right? What was two weeks ago? Oh boy, we're stretching back. What was two weeks ago? Power over what? The giants, right? So this is where Joel comes into play. <laughs> uh, how many of us turn little things into big things? This should be a unanimous, like, raise my hand. This is what we do on a daily basis, right? Like, it's all big things. Um, I, I was thinking, I was like, you know, thinking of examples of turning little things into big things. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, get get paid this week and I'm doing bills and I was like that's a little thing turned into a big thing um, you know uh, the snow over the past few days right how big is a snowflake little tiny you can't even really see it without getting a magnifying glass you can't see the majesty of a snowflake without pulling it out but when you look around this this Friday morning we walk outside and there's six inches of snow sitting out there like holy cow a little thing turned into big things then, then I think, uh, you know, <laughs> was thinking of, of, anybody have any small projects around the house? Right? Yeah, right. right. You're like, oh, you know, what, 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 okay, every, every person in here that's ever fixed anything, oh, that'll take an hour. I'll be able to get this done this afternoon. What happens? 
three days, four days, ask my wife, three months later, I finally get to it, and then we actually get it fixed, and sometimes that even drags out further. <laughs> we, turn, we turn little things into big things. So th that's the message that God had in my heart, because um, we're all guilty of that. Pastor brought the message so eloquently the past couple of weeks of conquering the giants and conquering the little things. But what about us that turn the little things into the big things? Um, that's uh, what Joel is, is talking about. The, the beginning of the book of Joel, we're looking at an invasion in the land, right? Um, if, and if you have a chance, I mean, you're, if there's a Bible in the pew, feel free. It's only a couple chapters, three chapters long, so... It's not going to take you long to read through this. But they have locust. Locust. Now, I, I think, what was it, two or three years ago we had the 17-year locust, right? So two or three years ago they show up. Now for us, does it really change our lifestyle tremendously? I mean, it's kind of a pain in the butt to drive around with your windows down because you might have one dive bomb you through your car window. Or you walk outside the house and one's swooping down at you. But imagine so many of these locusts that they cover everything, that they kill off your grass, they destroy your water, they destroy your crops. Now your animals are starving because they have nothing to drink and nothing to eat. There's a drought in the land, it's hot, and these locusts are killing everything. And Joel says, whoa, hey, hold up, watch out. And, and that, that's where Joel comes in. Now, I, I, was, I was thinking about um, you know, some examples, you know, and there was a, there was a book, um, there was a book several years ago, and some of you guys might remember this, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Do you guys remember the rest of that title? Anybody that read the book, And It's All Small Stuff? Larry's saying it, because Larry, Larry's seen it. Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, it's all small stuff. And, and a lot of times we, we believe that with our life. I, I wanted to, to read a description of that book, because it, it came to mind as I was preparing this. And this is, this is on a book, right? This is on a book that's on straight off of Amazon, so you could go online and you could order it if you want. It says, This groundbreaking inspirational guide, a classic into the self-help genre, shows you how to put challenges into perspective, reduce stress and anxiety through small daily changes, and find the path to achieving your goals. Among the insights as it reveals is to think of your problems as potential teachers. Do one thing at a time. Share glory with others. Learn to trust your intuitions. <laughs> That's off a book. What if I said, hey, the Bible. The Bible is this groundbreaking inspirational guide. Right? Right? The Bible. It's a classic. <laughs> what book has been printed this long throughout history and has been trying to snuff out so much but is still continuously being sold all throughout? You can go to Big Lots and pick up a Bible for a few dollars, right? Um, this is what the Bible does. It, it, think of your problems as potential teachers. Christ was a teacher. He looked at the problems of others and he, he intervened. We think of do one thing at a time. Focus upon me. Do one thing. Focus upon me. Share glory with others. How about share glory with God? You know, it, learn to trust your intuitions. How about learn to trust God? So when I think of these things, this is a, a, a worldly secular book that's out that any of us could buy, but we have this in the Bible. We have this in Joel. In Joel. The first part of this, and, and, and I, I'm not going to read the entire book, and I do have some excerpts of Scripture throughout. Um, like I said, I encourage you to read it while we're here. We see the problem. Joel sees the problem. How many of us recognize problems? How many of us, you know, we, 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 we kind of, yeah, I see that. But do we do anything about it? <laughs> How many of us let the problem sit for a while and marinate? You add a tea leaf into a glass of water, what happens? It starts changing the water. It's just a small tea leaf, but it changes the water. So we think, are we seeing the little things? Are our eyes open? Do we recognize? You know, we might not look, initially look at a locust and think that's a big problem, but Joel said it is. We might not look at that, that, that little thing that we've done, that little bit of maybe, I'm going to bend this this way, or I'm going to maybe, you know, ex I don't know, I'm going to stretch this a little bit, I'm going to turn that a little bit. We see these little things, and we start looking at the little things until they add up to more. So do we recognize those? Are we creating the mountains out of the molehills? 
are we seeing what we're doing as being more than what it is? Do we look at it in a spiritual context? Joel's talking about a very physical destruction of the land due to small little locusts. Little thing becoming big. But do we see that little part of us that gets overtaken by the little things that come around? Do we make that mountain out of a molehill? Do we recognize it? Um, I, I was thinking when we make mountains out of molehills, one of my favorite scriptures, and I hope you guys, you know, we all know this, we've all heard it. In Matthew, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, making a mountain out of a molehill, right? Don't present it bigger than what it is. Let God handle it even when it's just the molehill. You know, uh, you can say to that mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I want a favorite scripture that I think a lot of us have heard throughout our, our life and that we know. Um, but Joel says, you know, recognize these little things. See them. See them for what they are. See them in our spiritual walk. Do we see the little things? Do we see the little compromises that we make along the way to say, ah, that's okay. I'm going to let that slide. Oh, that's not a big deal. And then what happens? It escalates. It gets bigger. And then you do feel like you have a mountain in front of you. Again, the scripture, move mountain, and it'll move. Um, again, Joel, seeing this, realizes there's something that he needs to do. So if you read the beginning part of that scripture, he's, he's calling out. He says, elders, priest, prepare, prepare. Joel says, call for help and prepare yourself. When you see these little things that are happening, are we reaching out? Are we calling for help? He, he says, actually in Joel 1.14, declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land of, to the house to the Lord your God and cry out to God. Call out for help. That project I was mentioning earlier that you get started on and you realize like, oh boy, now I'm in over my head. <laughs> do you sit there and keep whittling at it or do you say, hey, I need a hand? I need a hand. We're willing to do that. We're willing to do that with, with projects, right? We're willing to do that with the physical parts in our lives. We're willing to do that with, um, you know, replacing a porch or paving a driveway or whatever. We're, 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 we'll do that with the, the projects. We'll do that with our homes and with our cars. I can't fix my truck. I just know that if it's something comes wrong, I can change the wheel. But man, something else, I need to reach out for help. But do we do it on our spiritual walk? Are we too proud to say, man, I, I need help in this area? Are we too proud to go to our, our, our elders and say, help me, help me. I need help. I, I need help. I need, I need that spiritual insight. I need more like I said, we're willing to do it with a lot of other things. We do it with our health. We go to a doctor, right? But do we do it in our spiritual walk? And, 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 and I have to think for that, that what he says is to call for help. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. In Joel, in, in, in 2.12, he says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Fasting, weeping, and mourning. Are we broken for that help? Do we see there is no other option but God? Even for the little things, even for the little things that have come, come longer, are we declaring, are we saying, Lord, I'm returning to you with this issue. It's beyond anything. Lord, I don't even want this issue. I, I'm coming to you, return to you. When you've denied that that little issue is even an issue, when you've denied that it's something that can control your life, are you saying, Lord, I'm, I'm going to return to you? I'm going to do it with fasting. By the way, what's fasting? Is that, we can say prayerfully, like, oh, I pray throughout the day. It's great. When you fast, are you doing it with intention? Fasting is something that's done with intention. It's done with, with um, the purpose. It's, it's done with, with the uh, discipline to say, I'm, I'm fasting this purpose throughout my life. I'm doing it intentionally. Weeping and mourning, that's a state of the heart. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that are brokenhearted. We oftentimes forget that the little things do become big if they're not tended to. So where do we turn these little things over to God? Where do we say, Lord, this is, this is more than me. This is you. And the reality is, should it ever really be more than us? That's later on. That's 
page five of the notes here that we have. And, um, so anyways, it's very easy to, to, to think that, oh, I'll just call out for some help. Now, th this goes for, and, and I know who I'm, you know, you, most of you guys I, I know, you know, fairly well, and, and we've been in church together for years. Call out for help. You're going to be on the receiving side of that, right? How many people are on the receiving side? I need help. We all do that, right? If someone says, hey, Mark, or hey, hey, Jeff, or hey, Larry. Hey, Larry. What's the responsibility of someone calling out to help? Are we called to fix their problem? Am I called to fix anybody's problem? Or am I called to pray with them? Am I called to help them stand up when they can't stand? Am I called to lift them up in prayer? Who's ultimately going to fix a lot of the things in our lives? Is it truly us? If we're seeking God, we're going to be seeking His will. If we're seeking God, we're going to be seeking, Lord, what do you want me to do with this scenario? Lord, where do I need to be? When someone calls you for help, is that a call for you to run out and say, Hey, Larry, so-and-so over here asked me for help, so I need you to help me. This is what's going on. Blah, 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 blah. I've just spilled confidence that someone has had in me for help to someone else. Do I need to do that? God knows the need. Do we, we believe that, right? We pray that many times. Lord, you know the need. You know the need of this family. You know the needs that are many. Lord, we, we've made that prayer ourselves. But sometimes in calling out for help, we're talking about spiritual help. Spiritual help is not necessarily by saying, I can fix your problems. Spiritual help is saying, I know the one that can fix your problems. I know the one that can walk ahead. I know who can deliver you from these little things that have become big. I know that one. That's the one that I know. Um, so I, I think the biggest part is of, <coughs> sorry about that. The biggest part of that is, <coughs> I don't know why I turn because the microphone's still here even when I turn. <coughs> sorry. Um, Call out for help. Um, I'm guilty of not doing that. I, I'll be the first to tell you that I'm, I'm guilty of not doing that. I'm guilty of not going to my brothers and sisters and saying, hey, I just need your help. I just need your help. I, 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 I need your prayers. I need, I need you to put your hand upon me and I need you to pray. I need you to lift me up. I need you to be willing to open your heart for me. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of not doing that. I'm guilty of thinking I've got this handled and I don't need help. I'm guilty of saying, man, I, I'm good. I'm good. I got it. I, I'm proud. I can handle this. I handle much smaller things. So I can handle this. I handle, I handle things that are insignificant. So I, I, I've got this. And in nowhere in that conversation do I say, I need help. I need the help of the elders, of the pastors, of the priest, of my Sunday school teacher. I need the help of my friends. Much less am I saying, do I need the help of God? Because I believe I can do it myself. Man, sometimes I get out of there and i got to remind myself, stop, Mark. Stop. Slow down. Whose help are we truly needing? It's God's. We need the help of others. We need others to lift us up. We need to prayerfully come together uh, and fast and, and weeping and mourning. Laying it out there. Lord, I need the help. I want to get this taken care of so I can get right back with you and that I can, I, I can um, find myself spiritually better off. Thank you, Tori. Look at this. This, this is my pew partners for the today. Uh, I, I was up here and I was like, you know, it, by the way, when you're sitting up here and you're, you're, you're up here and there's no one else around you, um, it was like, whoa, you know, I did that last time I sat over here, I think, and, and there was no one around me. I looked over to Danny today and I was like, Danny, it's good to have you up here. Yeah, we'll sing together. It's great. So when Tori joined us after offering, it was like, yeah, all right, the three amigos, we're good. Um, pew buddies, you know, pew partners. Um, but talk about help. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, anyways, mo moving along, calling out for help. The help is the obligation is not necessarily to. 
um, sit there and think we can do it, that's call it out. But even if we're the ones that are, you know, helping, the obligation is to be true to that, to be earnest with that, to, to go with weeping and mourning, to, to say, Lord, your will, Lord, your will be done. Um, again, take time to be intentional. Take time to, to fast over those issues, to give up uh, part of your day, part of your lunch, part of your whatever to come to God um, in the weeping in the morning. Be intentional with that. Third part of what Joel talks about, though, is repenting. Repenting. When we see this small stuff and it's built up and it's now become something out of control, do we recognize sometimes we need to repent? It's not a fun word. It's not a fun word. I'll tell you that, that Joel actually writes this very well um, in 2.13. He says, rend your heart. Rend. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and He relents from sending calamity. Rend. That's a beautiful scripture, by the way. Just as it is written. I mean, I don't hear words like rend used very much anymore, so when I see that, I think, wow, that's amazing. But that is a beautiful scripture. Rend your hearts. What, what does rend mean? Rend is, a, again, it's a call for repentance. Rend. Um, Brent, to, to separate. To separate. It, actually, you know, with modern technology, we have in our fingertips a dictionary anytime we want it, right? So to look it up, Rend, one of the definitions that came up was to tear or separate as a sign of anger, grief, or despair. To mourn your heart. Are we willing to repent? Are we willing to rend, to separate our heart? from whatever the situation is? Are we willing to separate ourselves so that we can see beyond where we're at, to see beyond the little things and see that there is a solution that's bigger than us? Can we separate ourselves from the situation to know, God, you're in this. This is your situation. This is your will. This is what you want. And Lord, I'm returning to you. I'm going to separate myself from this. Return to you. You, Lord, you God, are gracious. You're compassionate. You're slow to anger. Thank you. Goodness, my God is slow to anger. Amen. Thank goodness that I have a God that understands that we are completely human. Thank God that I have a, you know, that, that He is who He is and I am not. One thing I am not all the time is slow to anger. But He is. Amen. He has shown more compassion throughout times and even recently. I mean, I'm not going to get on a soapbox of talking about recent events, but my goodness, some of the things we're doing you know, to human lives versus saving the whales, no offense, I, I kind of have to scratch my head at. But he is slow to anger. Thank goodness. He's abounding in love. He relents. He goes away from actually wanting to send calamity. He does not want that in our lives. So again, rend your hearts. Separate. Separate your hearts from those things that have brought you down to this point. Separate your heart from the things that that, that have brought you to where you're at and you see no other outcome. See no other outcome. God hears you. <clears throat> God hears you. In verse 18, Then the Lord was jealous for His land. Then the Lord was jealous for His land. He heard the cries. He heard the mourning. He heard the prayers. He heard the weeping. The Lord was jealous for His land. And he took pity upon His people. That's a powerful statement. Let's, let's just... Let's get down to the little things again. Then the Lord is jealous for you. He took pity. In Joel, he talks about how, the, how the, the locusts have destroyed everything, that the vineyards are no longer having wine, that the water is tainted, that the food is gone. Later on, he talks about he, he takes pity on the land and he restores the new wine. By the way, if we want to talk about a book of Joel being a book of prophecy, the new wine could also mean new covenant, meaning his son. He provided his son. He restored the grain. He restored the wine. He restored all of that. When we see the issues that have surrounded us and we see that there's no way out, do we look and we say, but there already is a way. The way has already been determined. I need to find closer to you, God. I need to be closer to you. Have faith that God hears you. Have faith. He does respond. Have faith that he hears the prayers of his people. Do we truly, truly believe that there is anything too small or too big for our God? 
I, th- I, I think a lot of times too small. Lord, that's insignificant. I can handle this. Or Lord, that's way too big and I don't even see. That's beyond me. There's too many other hands out of control. That's way beyond me. I see that in my own life. That, that I, I, again, Lord, you, I work up at the hospital, up at, up at uh, Mon General, and, and I think, Lord, that, that hospital is way bigger than me. How can I even begin to make a difference? How can I even begin to start on that? But do I believe that God can work? If I'm truly believing, I'm praying, Lord, your will be done even in those that are non-believers. That your will be done even through those that don't know you. That your will becomes evident to those realizing that you are in control, that you are over the little and the big things. That you are that God. That that's the God that you are. When I think of God being in control, and this goes, all my caravan teachers ought to say this with me. Um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. He will direct your path through the little things, through the big things, through the things that we think are insignificant, through the things that we think that are way bigger than our approach from now and to the things that we don't even have a perspective on. Joel is saying that even in this. Lord, you will. Now, do we expect God to move? (laughs) When we're talking to God, do we expect Him to move? I think a lot of times when we are seeing this, we're going... I don't know. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray because it's what I know to do. But are we saying, Lord, I'm expecting that your will be done? I I think James. James, he says, if it's the Lord's will, we will live. We will do this or that. That's James 4.15. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live. We will do this or that. The Lord's will. If the insignificant things draw you closer to God, is it worth it? Is it worth it? If the big things, the things that are way out of our control that we get consumed within and the things that consume us, if it draws you closer to God, is it worth it? Absolutely. We think sometimes that the Bible is put together to be a history book, to tell us, you know, I, this is a cool story about Joel and the land. This was, you know, six, seven hundred years before Christ was born, and it's a really neat story, and thank you, Joel, that's cool. You brought us a great history lesson. Or do we say, Lord, where's the spiritual aspect of this? Where is your will? His will can be imposed physically, and, and I believe that, the providence of our lives, the providence of the what's going on, the providence in our world is, is ultimately through His will. But His will is greater than any one, one, one circumstance. His will is greater than any one place in our lives. It supersedes anything that, that we will go through. So if we're going through those moments, if we're seeing everything that is around us being escalated, are we saying, Lord, thank you for bringing me closer to you? How hard is that? We've had several families in the church that have lost loved ones recently. Lord, if it brings me closer to you, if it brings me closer to you. When, when, when you've been through search situations that you found yourself, a friend of yours on life's death door, you know, death's door rather, are you saying, Lord, if it brings me closer to you. Lord, if your will is truly coming through on this, Lord, is it worth it? If it brings me closer to God, the answer is always going to be yes. Sin is a separation from God. Coming closer to God is part of that rending and that restoring. We're expecting Him to move. Um, but expect, expect Him to move beyond what we think. How many of us are, are, we pray for the answer that we want? Oh, right, right, yeah. Like, Lord, I really need, I'm just going to throw this out there because I don't do this, but if I just had a million dollars, Lord, that would fix everything. <laughs> right? You pray for the answer you want. Right? You, 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 you say, Lord, I, I really need this. It, it, you know, 
pray for something you want and then sit back and watch God actually move and then kind of chuckle when you realize that God has something totally different in store. You want to make God laugh, tell Him what you think you ought to do with your life. Right? You want to make God laugh, tell Him, Lord, this is where I need to be. Lord, this is what I'm going to do. Or are you saying, Lord, if it's your will, take me there. Guide me ahead. You know, guide ahead of me. Make the path straight. Fill in the valleys. Bring the mountains down. Lord, if it's your will and I'm in your will and that mountain's ahead of me, I can say, move. God and I are coming through. Right? Are we willing to say that? Are we in his will enough to say, Lord, whatever that is, you are already going through that with me. And I know. There is such a faith to know that our God handles these situations. Now, when I bring this, I look at, look at what, what's coming, expecting God to move. When we get into to later on, he goes in and, and, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. We're expecting an answer for us. The, the problem is the, the locust in, in Joel's case. The problem is all these little things are everywhere. They're in our homes, they're in our food, they're, they're, they destroyed everything. And he says, but afterward, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream. They will be inspired, your old men will be inspired. Your young men will see visions. Your young men will, will, will be focused on divine things. Even on my servants, the ones of my household, the ones that, 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 are, that are with me on this, even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The answer wasn't like, hey, Joel, I'm going to make this good for your household. Joel, I'm going to make this good just where you're at. Oh, no, we're going to fix this for everybody. Do we believe our God can do that? Do we believe that when we go in these little things that we realize that he's not only going to fix my problem, but he's going to utilize whatever problem that I'm bringing to God to fix others. Do we see that? He didn't just fix the scenario of Joel. He didn't fix Joel's prophecy. He, did, he fixed this for everybody. I will, pour out, I will pour out my spirit on all people. On all people. Don't resist the temptation to put God in a box and say, Lord, just fix my problem. Lord, just, just fix where I'm at. But say, Lord, your will be done. Your will in my life takes these things, Lord. I'm, I'm giving these things to you. I'm rending these things from me. I'm rendering them from me so that I can come closer to you. And Lord, I know that you're going to fix not only the scenario that I'm in, but you're going to fix beyond that. Whether it's through providing a testimony that reaches others or prov providing maybe that he uses those that you've called upon to fix their worlds. Maybe it's in our church. Maybe it's in our church that I'm praying, Lord, whatever's in me, remove from me, rend from me those things that are holding me back, Lord, because the body of Christ and those outside of this building need to hear the message that you've provided here. They need to see that you're working in my life, that my discipline to you, that my, my coming to you, that my separation from the things that are holding me back and that are holding me down are able to drive me forward enough that I am affecting those outside of here. If we're a Christian that walks down and walks around and talks to others, not having a faith that our God can move bigger than us, what's our testimony? Well, I've been through everything. You guys ever see Eeyore, Eeyore and, and Pooh, Winnie the Pooh? Are, are you that Christian? Like, how's God doing? Well, not too good. <laughs> right? If anybody's seen Winnie the Pooh, that's, you know, Eeyore, how are you doing today? Not too good. Are you that Christian? Or are you the one that says, hey, this is just a temporary place. Hey, this is just a temporary circumstance. Hey, my God's already worked it out. I'm just believing that he's going to work this out moving forward, that it's not even going to be something that I have to worry about. I believe that it's bigger than me. We all want to be a part of something that's bigger than us. We all, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. We, we see each other on a Sunday morning and a Sunday nights and Wednesdays and activities. Why? We want to be part of something that's bigger than us. Our God is bigger than us in all aspects. The world needs to see that. The world needs to see that our God moves in us despite whatever we're going through. Does that doesn't mean that we don't carry stress? Sure we do. 
But are we doing the steps to identify it? Are we doing the steps to see? Are we doing the steps to move forward, to recognize? Are we repenting? Are we saying, Lord, take from me, rend from me all of this, Lord? And then are we saying, Lord, I'm expecting you to move. I'm expecting you to move beyond where I'm at. Last part I wanted to mention, because I don't want to be too late, because uh, I'll have a bunch of hungry people, and some folks get hangry when they get hungry, and I don't want any of that. <laughs> I want to leave you with the last bit of this is pretty straightforward. Um, All of that, if I could tell you guys anything, if I could tell you anything, remember who you are and remember who you belong to. I think so much we walk with the weight of the world that's on our shoulders. We walk with, 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 oh, I can't do it. I'm wore out, Lord. I've got nothing left in the tank. We carry those burdens and it's visible on us. We see it. But do we walk in faith knowing who we are? Joel says he's going to pour out his spirit. I'm going to read from Romans because I started the whole sermon saying what? Do we preach out of Romans? I'm going to end on Romans. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Remember who you are. And Joel is saying he's pouring out his spirit. This is 700 years later that Paul writes in Romans. It's Romans 8 and 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, again, sin, little things, big things, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit that lives in you. It is God who justifies. Who then is one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship? Shall those little things? Shall those big things? Are they going to separate us from that? Or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor the powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to read one verse out of there too. If you take anything else out of this today, if you take anything out, I want to go back to to 837. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Key word in there that kind of stuck out to me as I was reading this, more. More. It's one thing to be a conqueror, right? It's one thing to say, ah, I'm a conqueror. I've done it. God's done it. How about more? We are more than just conquerors. The Lord has fulfilled not only conquerors in this earth, in this life, in this body, but more than that. He's not only conquered where we're at right now, He's conquered where we're going to be, whether it's this earth or in heaven alone. He, we are more than conquerors. Do we walk around believing that we are truly more than conquerors? Or do we walk around defeated? I don't want to walk around defeated. I've done it. It's not fun. I don't like being on that side of things. I want to have the aspect of being like Joel and realizing, hey, these little things, it's just a chance for God to move. These little things that have become big things, again, it's a chance for Him to be seen. Because you know what? We are more than conquerors through His Son. We are. Joel saw it 700 years before Christ got here. Christ gets here and says, hey, not only can I solve locusts, see what I can do. I bore the sin. I had it nailed. I am the new wine. I am more than what you need. I'm not what you need. I'm more than what you need. And we are more than conquerors because of His sacrifice and what He has done in our lives. Have faith in that. Lift yourself up. Lift yourself up to see, I am more 
than what it is. I'm more than the circumstances I'm in. I'm more than the things that surround me. I'm more than the little things that are eaten away at my life. And I'm going to have faith, Lord, that you are working because you have already conquered this. Have faith in that. It, it's been a privilege to talk today, guys. It's been a privilege to bring a message. Um, I'm always humbled to be able to, to speak. Um, I'm humbled that Pastor Th asked me. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I'm grateful for an opportunity. And I just pray that the Lord has um, brought this message. Maybe it was just for me. Maybe it's for others. I don't know. But um, I'm grateful for a, a chance to be in, in with you guys and, and to be able to bring the message. So thank you very much.